Panorama TV presents How They Do That, where we explore the world of professional photographers and share their techniques with you. Here's your host, Mark Wallace. Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of How They Do That. I'm Mark Wallace. Well, on today's show, we have an amazing photographer. His name is Will Berard Lucas. And Will is a wildlife photographer from London, England. And he's traveled all over the world taking pictures of just about anything you can think of from the wild kingdom. And normally, he works with his brother, Matt. Now, unfortunately, Matt wasn't able to join us today because he's in Oxford, but we were able to sit down with Will and got all kinds of information about their travels. They've been all over the place. They've been to Africa and Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, North and South America, the Middle East, and all kinds of places. And they take pictures, again, of just about every conceivable animal on the planet. In fact, their work has been featured at the Natural History Museum in London. And we even have some of their photos hanging here in the United States at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. So thank you so much for joining us today, Will. Well, thanks for having me. It's a really uh, great opportunity for us to have our first overseas conversation, and you're actually in London, England. So tell us a little bit about uh, what time is it there right now? Uh, right now it's about 5 p.m., so it's the end of my working day. Okay, so I'm sure we might have a few cars zipping by during rush hour, so uh, we'll just deal with that. That's going to be sort of fun. But anyway, let's start with uh, talking about you and your brother. You guys decided to become photographers, so how did that all happen? How did you and your brother decide to go into business together? Well, the reason we got into photography is we, we both love traveling and so through our travels we, we got a digital camera to sort of document our trips and it all progressed from there, you know, you want to start getting better photos and you slowly upgrade your gear and then pretty quick actually it sort of spiralled and we uh, found ourselves getting pretty serious and so for a few years we, we were just sort of uh, hobbyists but as we started getting more into it we found we could we could get a lot better results when we worked together rather than just uh, working on our own so for quite a long time now about five years we've been working together to get our shots. Well have you always shot wildlife or is that something that, that you grew into? Um, well we've always loved wildlife and a lot of our travel always was revolved around it and so to start with we were probably shooting more general travel but we we quickly sort of honed in on wildlife and we, we could spend forever sort of out in the field photographing it. So it sort of happened naturally. Um, yeah. Well, let's look at some of the, the photos that you've taken. And another question I know that a lot of people are going to have is, I mean, you've traveled all over the world. How do you afford to travel all over the world? How do you make that happen? Well, to, to start with, I, I obviously had a day job. I've only been doing this full time for just over a year now. So obviously to start with, you've got to you ought to invest some of your your cash that you earned elsewhere, but then slowly we built up the business, and uh, so now it's you know we can we can just about afford where we want to go. One of the trademarks I think of your photos that I, I really love is that uh, you don't use. I mean, you may use some very long lenses, but I've seen a lot of your images that you're you're not using long lenses. You are really close to some really dangerous animals. How do you do that? Yeah, well, that, that's definitely something we really enjoy doing. It's you see a lot of wildlife photos taken with long lenses that have got a very shallow depth of field and you don't get the same perspective. So uh, for, for a long time we've really sort of aimed to get our camera as close as possible and use a wide angle photo because it just creates a photo with much more impact. So um, it depends obviously on what you're photographing, how you achieve it. We started off by photographing not so threatening animals, you know, like penguins and, and things where you could get quite close. Um, and uh, and you know photograph them safely but then more recently over the last few years we've been trying to do that with more impressive animals such as the animals in Africa or more recently like Komodo dragons and so for that we've had to sort of devise new techniques to get our camera nice and close to them. So let's talk about some of those gadgets that you have. Uh, one of them I really think is interesting is there's a, a photo of you guys and you have a camera that looks like it's on strings at the end of a tripod leg on the ledge of a cliff shooting penguins. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that was in the Falkland Islands, um, and we were there yeah, mainly photing penguins. That photo we're photographing birds, they're like cormorants, they're called rock shags. And we saw these, these birds nest, nesting under an overhang, and they had this spectacular sort of sea below them, and, and it just it looked amazing. But obviously, to get there um, as a person would have been impossible, as it was just, you know, 50 meters of uh, air between between them and the sea. So we sort of devised this technique that we called the puppet technique, where we hooked up our camera with string to the end of our tripod and sort of 
very slowly lowered it over the edge so that our camera was suspended in front of these nesting birds. And obviously uh, the key was to move very slowly so it wouldn't disturb them. And uh, we had a remote trigger. So one of us was sort of maneuvering the camera. The other one was on the other side so he could actually see where the camera was. That was my brother. And he, he could sort of direct me and then fire the camera when it was in position. So through that, we got some, some yeah, nice wide angle photos of these birds in their nests, which would be pretty hard to achieve any other way. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about um, one of my uh, favorite gadgets that you have is for shooting the uh, Komodo dragons. Um, so tell us, how you, I think you, you took an office chair and took wheels off or something like that. Tell us about that gadget. Yeah, that's right. So that was actually earlier this year. Um, I was going to Komodo Island for three days to photograph the Komodo dragons. And I really wanted to get these wide angle photos, but I had a very limited baggage allowance. And it, these things are pretty dangerous and very predatory, so you really can't get too close to them. So I had to think of a way to sort of get my camera up to them. And so what I did is I mounted it on a bar with two wheels and then attached a monopod to that so I could literally just wheel the camera along. And so that meant I, I could get about, I had to be within about three meters, two and a half meters of these things, but it obviously gave me a lot more comfort than if I was 20 centimeters away. So yeah, so that I, I you know, shipped that out there and uh, it worked, worked really well. Well, you have another gadget that I think Grant Imahara from Mythbusters would be proud of. It looks like a robot with a camera and some flashes on it. Is that what it is? What do you call that? Uh, that we called Beetle Cam, and uh, it's one of my more famous projects. So that was, we started that in 2009, and that was with the aim of getting wide angle photographs of African animals like elephants and lions. So that is literally a little remote control buggy with a camera mounted on top, a DSLR. And we took it out to Africa. We had no idea if it was going to work. We didn't know what the animals would think of it, whether they'd let it anywhere near them, whether they'd destroy it straight away. So uh, we took that out to Africa two weeks in Tanzania. And, uh, and it, yeah, it, it also worked pretty well. Uh, it worked well with, uh, with elephants and buffalo anyway. Uh, we tried it for the first time on lions and they were really curious. They came straight up to it and gave it an exploratory bite and then ran off with it. So that was a bit of a shock. And uh, looking back in, in hindsight, it was probably obviously what was gonna happen, but <laughs> we lost one of our cameras that way. But luckily we had a, we, they didn't destroy the buggy itself. And, uh, and we were able to put a 1D Mark III on instead and just concentrate on elephants and buffalo after that. Did you build that from scratch or is that something that you uh, you changed? I sort of built it from different parts that I sort of found on the internet. So the, the sort of base was a sort of robot chassis that sort of came as a kit, but then I had to sort of get the camera on and get the camera integrated with the remote control so I could fire it. And uh, so it was cobbling together different bits really. So are you gonna publish plans so other people can build these or are you just gonna sell them or is it yours alone? Oh, no, I, I was very open. We released the results last year and I was very open about, um, you know, the kit I used and roughly how I put it together. So Wired did a feature and they, they sort of listed out the components. So, yeah, and you can visit our website and read all about it. So, um, yeah, anyone anyone's interested, they can find out quite a lot about how we made it. Well, let's talk about uh, how you trigger your, your cameras when they're on these remote control uh, little buggies and sticks and things like that. Because you not only have a camera, but you have flashes. How do you control exposure and make sure that the flashes are properly exposing? Well, so the flashes we had um, were working through ETTL. So they, they were taking the metering from the camera and we trust the camera to do the metering. So we sort of just have it on evaluative metering and we sort of know as we're aiming the camera, you know, that we've got a you know, we can't have too much sky in or whatever because then it's probably gonna, you know, underexpose it or whatever. So we have to sort of, we set the camera to auto modes and then, you know, as we're driving it, we've got to be aware of what the modes are, you know, where the focus points select and, and things like that to, so that we get the best chance of getting the right exposure. Um, so it is trial and error and you've got to take a lot of photos to, to get, you know, ones that are sharp and in focus and properly exposed. So, you, you know, for every 10 that you take, only a couple might, might work out okay. But, you know, at the end of the day, that produces enough good results. And how are you, uh, what's your focus mode? Is it on, uh, you're on uh, shooting Canon, so is that AI servo where you're continuously focusing? Depends on the camera we're using, but usually we just have it on one shot with all focus points selected. And then we, we're sort of conscious to try and get, get the subject roughly in the middle and that, that way it, um, that way it generally focuses all right. I mean, often it, you'll find it focusing on grass that's in the foreground and things. So it, it, is, a bit, it is a bit hit and miss, but um, that was a res the mode we found get, gave the best results. Do you find yourself doing a lot of post-production cropping and adjusting sort of the composition of your images, or do you just take them right out of the camera? How, what's your post-production process? 
Uh, those did need a bit of cropping and things because it's very hard to compose it when you're 50 meters away in a vehicle but um, and often the ground might not be level so the camera might be a bit tilted so there's always a little bit of uh of maybe you know straightening and tiny bit of cropping but we try not to do too much um and then obviously uh, we use, we're using lightroom just to you know tweak the the raw files to make sure you know the contrast saturation levels and all that is you know makes the photos pop but we we don't we try not to do too much and certainly don't do much, anything in the way of sort of cloning and removing elements and things so with all that travel can you give us some pointers on how you uh, travel with your gear what kind of bags do you use what kind of uh, cameras are you using what uh, how do you manage uh, your batteries and charging and storage and do you have laptops walk us through what you're taking with you when you're traveling we take as much as we can hand luggage certainly our camera bodies and our big expensive lenses and then sometimes airlines as i'm sure you'll know have pretty strict weight limits on on hand luggage so one of the ways we get around that is we have these photo vests which have really big pockets and we can get about 12 kilograms into them so that that, that make we can make our backpacks nice and light doing that so that's de definitely a useful tip i can share and uh yeah and then so that's that's generally how we sort of get our stuff out there and then um in terms of what, what we're traveling with for backing up we take a laptop and then two external hard drives usually at least two and whenever we're at, at the end of the day we'll take the compact flash card we'll back it up onto both hard drives and then we'll always leave one hard drive in the room and keep one hard drive on us so if we get mugged or if the room's broken into we've always got a backup of our photos because if you spent a lot of money to go out there you don't want to lose your pictures so we're, we're pretty careful about that. Well, tell us specifically, people are going to want to know, what brand of hard drives are you using? What brand of cameras? Tell us exactly, if you can, what you're using. Okay, well, brand of cameras, we use Canon. So mainly a Canon 1D Mark IV and a Canon 1DS Mark III. Some of our other projects, we, we put a smaller camera, for example, on the remote control car. So we've got, we've got a range of cameras, but the, the two 1Ds are our sort of workhorses. Uh, we use a MacBook Air, uh, which is you know the smallest one for traveling with because it's nice and uh, compact. Uh, hard drives, we've got quite a range. We've got Lacy's, um, the rugged drives. We've got um, a couple of Adata ones. Uh, the most recent ones we've got are, I think they're Western Digital, but um, we, I mean, we just make sure we've got several copies. So if any one drive does fail, we're generally okay. So can you tell us a little bit about um, some of your, your personal mission for taking all of these photographs and what you're trying to accomplish? Fundamentally what we're trying to accomplish is to get interesting, different, original photos. In wildlife photography, it's impossible to make a living if you're just taking the same photos that people have seen before. So our ultimate aim in all of our projects is to get something different, whether that's going somewhere very unusual and photographing unusual creatures, for example in Madagascar, or whether it's going somewhere like Africa and using something like our remote control car to get different photos of commonly photographed animals like elephants and lions. So that's our, um, that's, that's certainly what we aim to achieve. I mean, broadly speaking, also what we're trying to aim to do is, you know, just inspire people to sort of see these animals, you know, through new eyes, accelerate, you know, all these wonderful creatures that exist on our planet and all the amazing things that they're doing. So just to inspire people to, you know, care more about our planet is also one of our aims. Well, I think you're doing a good job of it. And one of the things that I think is evidence of this is your photos are used in some very um, prestigious places. In fact, I believe you've had some images here in the Smithsonian. Is that true? Yeah, at the moment we've got, um, I think, a couple up in a, in a nature's best exhibit there. So a penguin image. Um, so that's the sort of competition that's run there each year. And so we usually have a, an image or two in that. Well, let's close really fast. I want to talk about this gorilla image that you sent to us because it's pretty amazing. How did you capture that emotion? How did you get those gorillas to, to behave like that? Yes, yeah, so that was it taken in Rwanda in the Volcanoes National Park. And those are two, you know, young gorillas. And I mean, I didn't do anything to get them to do that. They were just uh, rolling around having a really good play with each other. So, um, so it was just a case of sort of getting nice and low on their level and uh, snapping away as they as they rolled around in the foliage. So, yeah, I mean, that was a really special moment just to be there and observe it. And I was, um, you know, very fortunate. I came away with some nice photos of it. Well, well, it's been a pleasure having you here today. So I know that you're on Facebook. You've got a blog. You've got a great website. Can you tell people where they can find more of your work? Yeah, so our sort of online home is our website, which is www.barradlucas.com. And then we're also pretty active on social media. So Facebook, uh, facebook.com stroke BL Photography. Twitter, twitter.com stroke Will BL. We're on Google Plus and uh, 
uh, Flickr and 500px. So there's plenty of places you can sort of connect with us and uh, view our work. Well, that's awesome. And I hope people get out there and connect with you because it's well worth it. A lot of inspirational images and a lot of instruction as well. So thanks again for being with us today. Okay, thank you very much. Well, you can see more of Will and Matt's work at their website, berard-lucas.com. Make sure you check it out because they've got all kinds of really interesting features. They've got this little explorer where you can look by uh, area and region. So you can say, I want to look in North America and all the animals that they've shot there. Or you can just look by animal and all kinds of different topics. It's a really amazing site. We'll also check out the Adorama Learning Center to see more interviews with other photographers. And make sure you watch our new series, Redefine with Tamara Lackey. Redefine is a show where Tamara talks to people about the work they love and the creative ways they find success, exploring inspirational advice, innovative methods, and life-enhancing technology. So check it out, it's cool. This episode is brought to you by Adorama TV. Visit the Adorama Learning Center where you'll find photography tips and techniques, links to the gear used in this episode, and related videos. For all the latest photography, video, and computer gear, visit Adorama.com. And the next time you're in New York City, visit our store located on 18th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue.